One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases, and it's the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting-edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now, here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Noseworthy. We're going to close out the discussion on quality as a, as a subcomponent of the content of your diet uh, by looking at the quality of fats. This is going to be a, actually a pretty short discussion. Uh, and I'm thinking I'm probably going to end up doing a review of the medical literature on this, perhaps even uh, bringing on some special guests to lend their expertise to the discussion. Because uh, if there's one area where <clears throat> general society has been hoodwinked, if you will, by pseudoscience, it's in the area of demonizing saturated fats and uh, praising or extolling the virtues of uh, vegetable and seed oils. And, and uh, basically the mantra goes like this, that you should be cooking with soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil, etc., And you should be absolutely avoiding saturated fats that you see in animal products, including things like lard and butter and tallow, suet, etc. Um, and the reason that they typically expound is because the, the former protects you against heart disease and the latter actually promotes it, the latter being the saturated fats. And I will tell you that <laughs> uh, that is the exact opposite of what science and biology actually teaches us. Uh, in fact, I've mentioned this a couple of times in some other episodes, but if you, if you look at um, incidence rates or the growth curves of different types of metabolic derangements like obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, dementia, cardiovascular disease, um, there is a sharp rise that coincides with the increased utilization, or let's call it a switchover, from traditional animal-based fats into uh, what we now call industrial seed and vegetable oils. And so the bottom line is this, is that when you, when you heat oils, um, several things happen or don't. One is you oxidize them and you produce free radicals that then damage tissue and can increase your inflammatory response. Or in some cases, um, the chemical structure of the heated oil actually begins to form polymers. Uh, if you've ever been into a fast food restaurant, say like McDonald's or Burger King, and you walk in and the floor feels slippery all the time, even though they may have just uh, actually washed it or mopped it, that's because these heated vegetable oil molecules that they're using in their fry bins uh, float around, they attach to different surfaces on the floor, the countertop, even the wall, and they actually form a polymer coating. Uh, this is what you're actually feeling. And this is, uh, you know, can you imagine what it's like if that's happening on the surfaces of the restaurant? What is it doing to your body? Now, I don't want to turn this into a full scientific treatment. What I want to do is just give you the practical applications. Is that if you are doing what most North Americans have been doing, I would say most people in industrialized countries for the last 30, 40 years, is you're probably cooking with corn oil, uh, soybean oil, canola oil, uh, peanut oil, all of these different things. Uh, these things, without a doubt, without a doubt, are contributing to your inflammation. And one of the best things that you can do is to absolutely, totally eliminate your usage of things. Now, sometimes if you're eating out, maybe that's just part of your lifestyle that you can't really change. Maybe it's because you have to travel for work and on the road, you just don't have the choices that you do at home. But I'm telling you, when you're at home and you have control, what goes into your kitchen, into your food, and ultimately into your mouth, you should never be cooking with vegetable oils or seed oils. And, and again, we're talking about corn oil, uh, vegetable oils, sunflower, safflower, safflower, soybean, and if I didn't say it, canola oil. Get rid of it. It's, it's causing problems. What do you replace that with? Well, we have healthy alternatives like olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, and even into the realm of animal fats where you can cook with lard, uh, suet, tallow, duck fat, bacon grease, ghee, which is clarified butter, and good old-fashioned butter. While I'm on that, get rid of the margarine. 
it's plastic. It's a synthetic product that's not protecting your heart. It's not doing what you think it, it is doing for you. And you might be saying, well, that's ridiculous because everybody knows that saturated fat causes heart disease. And I would say to you that nobody knows that. In fact, what we know is the exact opposite. When we look at all the different studies that show the incidence of heart disease in people who consume predominantly saturated fats versus these other vegetable and seed oils, um, we see much higher rates of inflammatory disorders and cardiovascular disease, and I would say even changes in the brain associated with vegetable and seed oil consumption as compared to the higher saturated fats. Don't believe the hype. It's non-scientific. You can't really support it. Um, and if that is something that your doctors are telling you, they're just completely unaware of what their own medical research actually tells them. Now with that, let's bring the, the quality segment to a close and, and move on to the next digit in the combination. Now, if you just dropped into this whole podcast segment, we've been talking about uh, discovering your personal food code or basically optimizing your diet. And I use the analogy of having a combination lock where you have to have the right digit in the right place in the right sequence on the combination lock for the lock to open. And your diet is very much like that. And we've been going through each individual uh, entry, if you will, into that uh, personal food code. And now I want to talk about when you eat. We've talked about quantity and how much you eat. We've talked about what you eat in terms of macronutrients and content of your diet profile, as well as the quality of the foods that you eat. Now I want to talk about chronology or chronicity or chronometry, which is just a fancy way of saying when you eat. And I like it because it's got a C and it rhymes with everything else. But nevertheless, you know, when I, when I was old enough to start paying attention, I grew up eating three square meals a day. I was fortunate enough to have a mom uh, who stayed home and took care of us. You know, so I woke up, we had breakfast. Uh, if I was at school, I actually lived like a quarter mile away from the school where I went to elementary school. So I would come home for lunch in grades K through six. And then we would always have dinner on the table. And it was actually extremely rare for us back in the 60s and 70s to go out to dinner. It was a big deal when we would load up in the car on a periodic Sunday and end up going out to uh, A&W, which was at the time that was the only fast food restaurant that we had. I have delicious memories of it, but I don't eat there anymore. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I grew up with three square meals. And of course, as a hungry kid, you come home from school and you're voracious. And so you kind of have that snack in the afternoon to tide you over until dinner time. And quite often we would snack on something uh, before we went to bed. It was never healthy. You know, we're talking ice cream and toast and butter and all that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, I grew up with three square meals a day. But when I was old enough to start paying attention to nutrition, we're talking about in in the late 70s into the 1980s, uh, the mantra from the nutritional world came to be five to six small meals spread evenly throughout the day. And uh, that was kind of universally promoted and uh, I would say almost universally accepted as the way to control your weight, to control your blood sugar, and to have even energy throughout the day. I, you know, for one can tell you as someone who does have a genetic predisposition to higher blood sugar, that if I eat um, five to six small meals a day, I can't really control the blood sugar, my blood sugar the way that I want to. So I, I actually eat larger amounts of food spaced a little bit further apart. And so I still kind of do either, um, you know, two meals plus a, a well-designed protein shake or sometimes three meals in a shake, depending on if I'm working out that day, if I'm lifting heavy weights. Um, I'll modify my diet just kind of based on my activity levels. But the bottom line is this. Just like everything else, there's no one size fits all. There are some people who will actually do very well if they're eating every couple of hours and they're eating small meals uh, throughout the day, like five or six small meals. And for the most part, these are the people who are going to have uh, reactive hypoglycemic blood sugar patterns and symptoms, right? Patterns meaning lab values, but symptoms re re uh, referring to uh, the quality of life and functionality. And so, you know, we have to kind of deal with this. So like for you as an individual, the choice between small frequent meals versus three square meals versus some form of intermittent fasting where maybe you have an eight or a six hour eating window or all the way to the other extreme. You literally, there are people out there 
uh, eating OMAD one meal a day and they eat everything they can for an hour and that's all they do. That's going to work for some people. But, you, you know, my general approach is understand the spectrum, look at the extremes. These are the exceptions rather than the rules. Most people are going to do well with something that's in between. And so the way that I have always constructed the timing element of diet for the patients that I'm, I hate the word patients, for the clients that I work with in my my one-on-one -on -one coaching programs, is we always gear the timing and the frequency of their meals based on their blood sugar stability and control. So it's very simple. It works like this. If you are a more of a reactive hypoglycemic, where if you skip a meal or don't eat enough food, or you wait too long in between, you get shaky, irritable, lightheaded, you get hangry, and then you feel better when you eat, then guess what? You need to eat smaller amounts more frequently throughout the day. You still have to eat your total quality, I'm sorry, quantity targets. You still have to eat enough food throughout the day. It's just that you don't have the metabolic stability control to space your meals out the way somebody else can. And, and this issue about whether or not you can go long periods of time without eating and still maintain function, this is what we call metabolic flexibility. And it's really tied up in your body's ability uh, to go, okay, you're not feeding me, which means I'm not going to get any carbohydrates or things coming into my mouth that I can use to create um, glucose with. I better switch to an alternative fuel source, and that's pro predominantly going to be body fat. The people who have the metabolic flexibility to not eat for long periods of time and still function well and feel great are the ones who have the ability to switch in and out of, say, fat burning mode at a moment's notice. That's what we call metabolic flexibility. And people with uh, dominant reactive hypoglycemic symptoms don't have that to one degree or another. And you, you may have that, you may have lost it to a little extent, you may have lost it to a great extent. I've had some clients we've worked with with some really bad reactive hypoglycemic symptoms that literally in the beginning had to eat every hour and a half. And we literally had told them, like, you need to set a timer. And when the timer goes off, you eat. It doesn't matter if you're hungry because you're eating for function, not for flavor or for satisfaction. And the general rule in that scenario is if you know that you can, say, only go two and a half hours without food before you start to feel some kind of a negative symptom, if it's two and a half hour window, you eat every two hours. If it's a two hour window, you eat every hour and a half. If it's a three hour window, you eat every two and a half hours. And so we take that window of, I can go this long before things fall apart and I'm gonna back it up by 30 minutes because once you let your system get into that state of reacting to low fuel status and it, your brain is activating and invoking your fight or flight responses, by the time you hit that, it's already too late and you're just playing catch up. The game is stay ahead of those events. And so you, you have to eat on a, on a schedule and with a frequency that prevents things, those things from happening. Well, what about the opposite end of the spectrum? What about someone who's got chronically high blood sugar as opposed to chronically low blood sugar? Well, these are people who typically are in the spectrum of insulin resistance, merging into metabolic syndrome, and then leaning towards, say, type 2 diabetes. It's hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia. And sometimes, yes, they're just simply eating too many carbohydrates, but there are a lot of people who can actually undereat and still have high blood sugar states. And that gets a little bit more complicated in terms of physiological maladaptation. Different topic, different segment of inflammation nation for a different day. My point is, is that if you are if you struggle with the high blood sugar stuff, with the, which the main symptoms are going to be, I eat particularly if I'm eating carbohydrates or a large meal and I get tired or I get, um, uh, I get cravings for sweets or some kind of a stimulant. So I, you know, I eat and I'm like, I've got to have that dessert or I eat and I've got to have coffee or in worst cases like nicotine to try to maintain that uh, mental capacity and clarity. And so on this hyperglycemic side, that's when we start thinking about spreading meals out, right? Cal calorie, slight calorie deficit, and then increasing your fasting window and absolutely controlling the amount of carbohydrates and the glycemic index of those carbohydrates so that when you do eat, you're not blowing your blood sugar out of the water. 
I will add one thing to that is that if you are on the high blood sugar side uh, and you're not, and all you're doing is you're manipulating your diet, right? You're eating less and you're eating uh, with more space in between your meals because you don't want to keep eating, spike your blood sugar, not have it go to baseline when you eat again and you spike it and your blood sugar keeps climbing up as does your insulin. You want to make sure that you're also increasing your activity level. Um, without getting into all the science behind it, uh, the glucose receptors, or I'm sorry, the insulin receptors that allow us to uh, take glucose into the cells are one of two different mechanisms by which we can control our blood sugar. But with high blood sugar states, we have some degree of insulin resistance. That mechanism doesn't work. There is what's called an exercise responsive system where it, totally independent of how your cells react to insulin if your blood sugar is high and you exercise, you can open the doors on your cell and glucose can get in even without your insulin working better. And so with your hypoglycemic states, the timing and the frequency of meals is spread out more with more fasting intervals. And this is where things like intermittent fasting, like maybe a, a 7 to 11 strategy where you stop eating at 7 at night, you don't eat your first meal until 11. Um, or just spacing your meals out, making sure you're controlling your carbohydrates and increasing your activity levels. That's kind of like the best prescription without getting into how do we support that whole mechanism using things like nutritional supplementation. So let me recap and then we'll close out this episode before we move on to the next topic. And, and that is the decision as to when you eat should be based on uh, timing your meals around your blood sugar stability and control. If you have low blood sugar, you're going to want to eat smaller meals more frequently. If you have high blood sugar, you're going to want to space out your meals and actually give yourself a chance to fast longer overnight between your last meal of one day, the first meal of the next, um, and give yourself some space in between the meals that you do eat and making sure that you're paying attention to your total carbohydrate intake how many carbs are you eating? Remember the sweet spot we talked about a couple of episodes ago. And also making sure um, that when you do eat carbohydrates, you're choosing glycemic friendly things that are lower on the glycemic index. So you're keeping your load and your glycemic index down. And that's the best of all worlds. So we'll close that for right now and we'll pick it up on the next episode. And we'll talk a little bit about why you're eating. Thank you so much for listening to the Inflammation Nation. If you found this episode valuable, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so that you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. And why not head over to my main website, drnoseworthy.com, that's drnoseworthy.com, to explore my personalized functional medicine coaching programs, submit a question to the podcast, maybe take a quiz, or even reach out to me using the contact form that you can find there. We'll see you next time.